Uh, I'm Seth Parker Woods, a cellist at, uh, well, mainly a soloist uh, and chamber musician. I teach at the University of Chicago, and I'm also now the outgoing artist in residence with the Seattle Symphony, where I've been with them for the last three years. So I'm going to leave today's chat pretty much open to you all. Um, there may be some ideas I have around corporeality as it relates to kind of finding ways to um, create a sense of choreography within your play and as it relates to the text, to the score. Um, but I'm definitely uh, excited to kind of see what you guys may have, uh, what you're wondering about or asking about. A lot of the work I do, of course, is in classical music, but also in contemporary music. And I spend a lot of time also championing um, that idiom of music and working with lots of young composers, lots of older established composers, um, creating new commissions for a cello concerti uh, to be premiered with some of the news. Uh, yeah. um, so which I guess we'll just wait for more and more people to kind of come on in here and then we'll, I guess we'll get started. Okay, the first question we have, could you please elaborate on how you developed your career after completing conservatory studies? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, so, um, well, I, I guess that's, a, that's an interesting one. So, kind of during my, even during my undergrad and my master's, but especially during, after, like, during my doctorate at that point, I was already very much so um, a live, like, professional performing musician, but I was already kind of finding ways of working. I studied in New York, uh, the only kind of U.S. training I have, and then everything else was in Europe. Um, so I really actually talked with my teacher, teacher, figure out ways in which um, ways in which to kind of start uh, performing. Um, and uh, I think my microphone is jumping in and out here. Um, ways in which to kind of find a kind of career paths. For a long time, I was. Uh, focusing heavily on uh, performing uh, with orchestra or performing in a ballet orchestra and then that kind of started shifting as I saw um, a larger interest in uh, chamber music and especially in solo music a lot of recital based work um, and so really working with my teachers to kind of start finding my first concerts starting to figure out how to create um, Programs, how you know, how do you curate your own recitals, works that you love, not necessarily just all the ones you had to study in school, um, but more so the ones that actually really call to you, because I think that will start to be part of the bedrock. Um, and then I just really started going out there, um, sending out proposals, and hopefully hearing back from a few places or presenters at the time, um, and started putting these things together. Of course, a lot of it's kind of crash and burn. You really learn what works, what flows really well. Also, it's your own stamina. Uh, for performing, especially long, long, large-scale programs, uh, recital programs, where even if that's concerti, um, uh, yeah. So I, that's that kind of the the short of it. Uh, next question: How have your personal views and thoughts on Bach's two measures uh, changed over time? Wow, I think it's constantly changing. <laughs> uh, since I first started first started learning the Bach suites, I think I was maybe. Maybe 10 or 11, I think. It was like the first time, you know, uh, the, the prelude was put in front of me to really start it um, by my, my very first teacher. And it's constantly changing over this time. At that time, it, was a, it wasn't an Urtex edition. It wasn't even the Magdalena. Uh, but another kind of, uh, not necessarily an arrangement, uh, but someone else, another cellist edits. So it finally making my way um, to, to the Urtex and really finding my own voice in it. And more so even these years, uh, these, at least we could say the last 10 years, really looking at um, what do the lines say? Where is the choreography built around, uh, around the, the notes and the text? Um, and how that then kind of relates to my own body. So basically trying to find a way to kind of archive my own choreography um, so that I have kind of a solid bedrock. Even if bowings change, even if like identities of uh, like harmonic structure change, how I feel those uh, kind of colors of light and dark um, heavy and light over time uh, and it's been quite interesting as I grow older as my technique gets even better and I'm constantly trying to make that change now even 36 years in now um, that I start to hear and see new things in the work um, and I think for me the G major suite is actually such it's such a personal um, 
and beautiful suite of, of all of them. Of course, there's so many great ones, and I think not everybody agrees on which ones are the best, but I think that's also the beauty of all these suites. Everyone kind of finds a little bit of themselves um, in each of the suites or in each of the movements from different suites. Um, so I've really kind of gone back and kind of take it, when I first started kind of coming to the Earth text, I basically took away all the bowings, uh, some of the fingering, not all the fingering, fingering really started to uh, break down um, what uh, what it is that I'm really um, trying to do here, where I'm trying to go. And I think it came when I was living in Europe and I had spent quite a large uh, period of time in Amsterdam and had some lessons with um, Anna Bilsma and then also when I was living in Switzerland uh, with Christophe Juan, the French cellist, Baroque cellist, um, that they really kind of turned around my head on what the suites are and what they can be and how they can exist. Um, and so it's been kind of an ever-changing kind of journey for me, but it's been um, an exciting one. Let's see. What is a little contemporary? What is the role of contemporary music in developing one's career in music? Okay, the role of, this is a, these are great questions, everyone. Um, the role of contemporary music in developing one's career. So I came to contemporary music actually rather early. Um, I was maybe 17. I was a, um, at that point, I think I was maybe my second year studying with the now late Andre Emelianoff. And he, of course, uh, being a cellist from the De Capo Chamber Players in New York City, they were covering a lot of contemporary music in that time. So one of the very early first works I uh, started studying with him um, was a work by Joan Towers for solo cello um, and then also doing another work by Lou Harrison so these were composers and sounds and rhythms that I never ever dealt with um, but I think through going through that it really challenged me to really look at technique look at perception of body in a, in a really interesting way um, and I think that has kind of guided me to, as I navigated the worlds of Kind of the old, <laughs> the old vanguard, the old standard classical music, Bach, Brahms, Beethoven, Schubert, and so on, um, against these newer works that are kind of coming out. How do I uh, find kind of commonalities between the two of them, the two of them, instead of it feeling that they are so so separate? Um, and for me, it's been really exciting. And I had a great mentor, Ursula Oppens, the pianist. She always said, "Play everything. Play, play all of it. Play all the music." Um, and I kind of still stick to this to this day, and I still tell my students the same things. You know, don't feel as if they need to be so separate. At the end of the day, they're, they're stories, they're narratives that you're trying to disseminate to an audience and share with an audience. But it's also very important, I think, that you find, uh, you find your voice also in that work. And then through doing that, I think it helps kind of guide you on what, what it is that you really are after artistically as a person, not necessarily just as a um, a musician, but more so, uh, what is your own personal voice? As we're always searching, especially in our younger years, trying to figure out what is our sound, what is our motivation, what is our intention, what kind of career are we looking for? We're looking to have uh, after you know you leave the conservatory academic gates. Um, so I think I, I'm kind of lucky in having come to contemporary music, or being kind of nudged heavily <laughs> by um, Andre. Um, into that world, um, it really kind of opened a lot of things and kept me um, as facile as possible. Um, and something that you know he kept at even after the years after leaving it, he would always ask, you know, what am I working on? Not necessarily just the the classical rep, but the contemporary rep, um, just to see kind of where my head is and what am I restricting myself for and keeping it open. And then he gave me all, give me like a, a full list in an email, you know of. You know all these composers he's heard are young composers that are kind of coming out of Juilliard at the time that of course I wouldn't know because um, I wasn't a student there anymore but um, what what they're into what he's hearing and what, what voices he thinks are probably interesting that I should kind of take on or or at least look up uh, yeah so okay, we have another question can you discuss the process of developing your personal sound or sound character every great musician has a sound that is identifiable you know exactly who is playing without seeing them whether it be a general Schaffron or a Lisa Weiler sign. Yes, two very distinct sounds. I mean, two very distinct artists. Um, how do we work on this and not become poor versions of our teachers or idols? Um, I think with every student, you are going to start listening. I think from the very beginning, you will be given tapes. Uh, my very, very first teacher was David Garrett, the cellist who was at the time um, 
in the cello section of the Houston Symphony and now for mi well quite a few decades now has been with the uh, LA Phil. Um, but I think he used to give me these old mixtapes, like cassette tapes, and it would just be filled with recordings either of himself playing recital works or uh, the 12 cellos of the um, Berlin Phil or you know, a wide variety. Uh, and I think that's actually where I first heard Rostropovich was on one of these tapes. Um, and you'd like scribble all the names and the pieces on the, on the front covers. Um, so you spend a lot of time listening, 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 and mostly not really understanding why those choices are being made. Of course, you don't see anything when you see no bones. You're hearing just the visceral sound of communication and expression. And I think eventually you have to stop that and you have to start to figure out what exactly is it that I'm trying to, uh, what am I trying to say? You know, these works are, many of these works are just so, so old and they're written in a very specific, specific moment in time. And many times we don't really necessarily know their history and their past. So I think it's important to one, learn their story, but also how do you relate on that level? Um, and I think for me, I think a lot of it came from doing continuously having the Bach as part of my life, but also tearing it apart, tearing it apart as much as I possibly can, and also breaking down my own technique, my own technique, and my own understanding of how I come to this instrument, and, and the idea that you know there's nothing quite normal or, or always completely comfortable about it, and trying to take what I've learned from my teachers and then also discard a lot of that, and, and then kind of restart myself all over again and figure out how how sounds um, and how do I create a kind of a voice of my own and what is it I'm trying to disseminate um, over over time um, so a lot of that has come in the way of the Bach other parts have has come in the way of doing a lot of interesting types of uh, contemporary music that really look at sound as an object as, a, as an intention um, what you're trying to produce where you're trying to produce and how you necessarily do that on the body so um, the the simple act of just of of just even playing a single a, a single note. Um, where exactly am I igniting the the actual sound? Am I pushing the sound? Am I pulling the sound? Are we wanting the sound to turn, or are we wanting to be more angular? So, uh, I spend a lot of time, especially in my in my at. Um, uh, ancillary sounds and or ancillary movement and primary movement. So what does that really mean? So the, the part of the body that really um, helps ignite it from the very beginning and then how you switch that over time. And of course that changes sometimes that's really quick within a, um, a given work. Even um, the Sarabhan for the G major. <laughs> already just in uh, those the kind of three measures there uh, but how I just look at the so we look at angles and I look at what is each note doing am I supposed to be having a direct intention for every single note or am I supposed to be trying to push it and move it um, throughout so I really look at is it coming from the elbow am I guiding from the elbow is the elbow help there to smooth out in between notes, whether that's eighth notes or sixteenth notes, is that um, is it coming from the fingers? Is the fingers actually the thing that ignites it and helps balance it? Um, and where does that actually happen? So then I'm trying to map that, and so that I continuously have that type of physical sensation each time I continuously come back to this work, and possibly even for many other works. And do they have kind of similar kind of profiles and narratives? So you, you realize, oh well, this is the same type of movement, the same type of sound that I was trying to get from this other thing here. So does this apply in the other way? Okay, I think I'm behind on questions, so I'm gonna jump. Okay, uh, from Kevin Fix. Uh, what is the best cheap strings to buy? Ooh, mine are so dead, it's not very inspiring to play. COVID has left me so broke, I can't afford strings at all right now. Okay, here is a good tip for you. Um, I would write, well, I always think Larson's are just great strings to have, um, but also Perostro is a great company as well. And many times what will happen, you can write them. You can write them, and especially if you're a student, or even if you're not a student, you can write them and say you're interested in trying new strings, and you've heard about whatever the, the, the brand is, um, and you can ask them if they could send you a set, maybe of an A or a D or a G or a C, uh, 
if you know sometimes your, the G string has a certain type of timbre to it and it doesn't fit all strings all the time, which is very possible based on your instrument, um, you know, you maybe want to not maybe them do a full set, but maybe do the A, ask them for just an A and B that you could, you could try. And let me tell you, many of my students have done this, and especially when I was early on, I did this. And uh, they still do this now. So, I mean, they want people to have the strings, of course, can, not everyone can always afford. We talked about the idea of access. Um, so I would, that is my major suggestion for you. Go onto their website and get their kind of contact, um, go find the contact information and write them directly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, question from Francesca McNeely. Hello, Francesca. Um, I said, any advice on finding more physical ease in the box? Uh, six Saraban, those cartoon stuff chords. Okay, uh, more ease. Okay, so I think this is kind of coming back um, to physicality. So, uh, and kind of uh, mapping choreography. So I think the thing in general for me always is to, I think when we're coming to learning something new at first, it, we're not necessarily always muscling it out and that's really not the best way, especially in the long, the long term frame of things. Um, I would really say to kind of really start with what whatever whatever are the basic chords that are there, not using a lot of pressure, figuring out exactly what takes the minimal amount of pressure and where can you redirect the movement. It's not always in the hand, it's not always in the wrist, maybe it's a larger um, ligament group that you're gonna use, maybe you're using uh, two parts together. Also ang angles um, of the bow against the hand are always really important, I think, in finding ways that you, you're, um, you can create kind of facile movement over time. And I think understanding the choreography that is there, I think what it, what it, is, it is that you need to do and you're wanting to do and understanding how you need to make that happen. Um, for me, that would be the, 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 the biggest um, tip I would have for you. And start slow and continue going <laughs> very slow. Continue going very slow. And that is not necessarily kind of sus uh, sustaining but more so just uh, taking it one step at a time and then building it up one, one especially in those chords, whew, one by one, <laughs> um, and figuring out what that balance, that balance is across the string, yeah. Um, question from Emilio Garcia, I skipped over. Uh, could you please give us um, advices for beautiful double stops in tune um, and resonant. I always make strange noises of strings that shouldn't sound. Thank you for this experience. Okay, so a really easy one. Um, just a ba ba basic chords here. Um, Maria Kliegel has this exercise. She just does these thirds or, or, or fourths. And this is probably in every probably technical book there probably is actually. Uh, but uh, you can take one string. The thing I always look for um, for a long time, I used this specific type of um, sense tuner so I could see exactly what the waveform was, but you don't, you don't have to do that like, too much. So I was also using that for a lot of contemporary music as well that had to have very specific uh, overtone partials that needed to be for the sound. But you can take the bass note, and I would really uh, twist around. Obviously, understanding uh, just kind of harmony and theory also helps obviously if you're going to have a third in there even if it's inverted if it's not in uh, the first um, it's not in, in a root positioning and maybe it's in a uh, first uh, first inversion or second inversion understanding what that chord structure is I think that theory still applies even in performance not just in analysis I always tell my students that so I think that's important people continue to, to remember uh, and you can just do uh, what I do. I do these chords every day and I just do them um, Chromatically. And you don't need a lot of bow. One thing I think I always tell my students is make sure that some part of this, especially when you're starting to do down bows or up bows, regardless if it's at the frog or the heel or at the, the tip, um, that you're not, you're not pushing, a, you know, pushing with all of your body, making sure you're still grounding from your hips. You're grounding from your hips and you're using the elbow, this doesn't apply for everything, but in this situation, especially if you're starting down or if, or if the chords within the repertoire are down, um, feel as if you really, it's almost like a brush stroke. You don't need a lot of weight and a lot of uh, directionality in this way um, to, produ to produce the sound. You could still glide or you, it just depends on what you want. And then I'm always say, also saying to pronate through the first strings, but now if you're on the upper strings, 
if it is the way the cord is built, I would definitely look at if you're planning to have like maybe there's a. a balance here between the bow and the string, figuring out exactly where the hand is here for the C-sharp. Sorry guys, I'm also in 450. I've been doing all this Bach, so I'm, I'm a half step below everybody else. Uh, so. so I would take each chord, break it down, and then also figure out exactly where I need to be angular-wise. Am I over both strings? Am I kind of teeter-tottering between the two? Um, if it's a long sus uh, sustained chord, I think I would definitely use more of the elbow up front and then transition the weight and, um, and tension to, um, to the finger, especially the first and fourth, just so you balance between one and four. The other two here are for stability. Um, don't, don't cramp your, your um, your thumb on the other side uh, as well. Um, I, I would really play around with that um, as well, try and get necessarily always on a down bow, but on an up bow, but also looking um, from the tip as well. Uh, try different rhythms there as well. Uh, make sure that you're always, you're either pushing, you have the idea that you're either pushing the sound or you're pulling the sound. And that's either up bow or down bow. I would, that's where you would start. Uh, on the bottom side. Uh, da, 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 da. Could you give tips on how um, to play freely within the meter of the music uh, and at times mess with tempo, uh, taking extra time here and there? Okay. Um, so, okay, even in the, let's take the box seats. Um, let's take the Aleman. So, I've heard so many versions of this, <laughs> either that are very in tempo or that are also um, that have a lot of freedom. Sometimes a little too much freedom, I find, and in, in the sense that the um, the overall pulse is completely obscured. And I think at the end of the day, you have to have a sense of meter. That's either meter in the sense of just uh, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six how you divide that, what is your phrase structure. So one of the first things, if we're looking at just the box beats, G major suite, Aleman, what is the phrase structure? Are you, are you playing in two bar phrases, four bar phrases? Where does Bach give kind of the first cadence? And then how, and then also understanding, is every note that kind of comes in some of these scalar passages as important? Or are you trying to highlight the specific harmony within all of it? So even in the very beginning of it, sorry, technically it should be but I really take a little bit more time on the first chord, but not too much because I still, even to this day, I'm still thinking whatever the sixteenths are like my inner kind of like micro pulse um, outside of so it's still in a kind of a two in, in that way but I'm I still need to feel kind of what is the inner pulse in there so I use that on the first chord <laughs> Sharp. 
Um, it'll come back later, and also the G sharp that comes in there. Um, so I realized that, okay, the, the first C sharp, for me at least, in my interpretation, um, is most important. The second one is a shadow of it. So I don't necessarily always have to, they don't have, both have to be there. So I can kind of cheat time a little bit or move through it a little bit more fluidly because I know that from the, the G, C sharp as kind of harmonies here, I'm going to um, resolve to an F sharp that then moves and then we highlight, we're back to C natural within that next bar. So the... But the C natural is leading us back to the B. So I'm always phrasing or pushing time or cheating time in some ways based on the harmonic structure, at least for this work. Um, so those are some of the things I think you could start looking at in that way. But of course, very slowly, yeah. Um, when you start working on a new obscure piece, um, that you probably need to make when you're making your break, uh, where do you start? How do you approach it, especially if you can't find any background information or recordings? Ah, okay, this happens a lot, even also in, in some Baroque music, especially like in the 17th uh, century when I just have manuscripts and maybe there are works um, that there don't exist in recordings for especially some um, less known uh, compositions. Um, what I end up doing, I soul fetch. <laughs> I, I soul fetch a lot of the information, uh, or I try to find people that have played some of his of uh, that composer's music, or I, if I can't find it, if it's a solo work, or um, I look at the chamber works, I look at also like maybe they have like larger ensemble works, orchestral works, uh, maybe even sometimes operas. Like where can I find that can start to give me an idea of the sound world that that composer is kind of coming from? That maybe that also informs because sometimes we find, especially if you're looking through old manuscripts of a few different works you start to see kind of um, a language, a language starts to build from, from that's based on previous works, maybe a, a two years before, five years before, 10 years before, and then maybe still writing in that same style. And that's not just necessarily only for contemporary music, but also for much older music, uh, Baroque music, Renaissance music, uh, medieval. So you can look at those things to kind of give you an idea, but also libraries are great for musicological research. These days, this day and age, um, there's so much on the internet. Um, and there's so many ways you can kind of uh, write to different people uh, that you may know of or may not even know of and you just, I, did, I always say, don't be afraid to send an email. Uh, it, the, the best thing or the worst thing that can happen is somebody actually replies and tells you something. Um, so that's kind of where I do first start. Once I, but when I'm looking at the score per se, um, I'm really looking at rhythm, I'm looking, I start to play a little bit of it to kind of get an idea. Um, and try to listen to whatever I possibly can, but sometimes that's not necessarily always available based on you know, who the composer is and maybe how well they may be archived. Um, and I sing through some of the parts and then try to start playing through some of the parts, um, looking at rhythmic, um, rhythmic content, looking at colorings, um, also sections that may be a little bit more technically difficult, especially if the writing is um, a little less conventional should say if it's requiring more extended techniques, if it's more in the contemporary music vein, um, especially from the 1950s onwards up till present. Um, some of it's very straightforward, others are not so much. Um, but also if you're still studying, I would definitely uh, pose that question to your teacher um, or also write to another in a musician, or especially in this case, another cellist that you know that may be specializing in contemporary music. I definitely had my fair share of emails with little screenshots of just a measure for, for a cellist that's looking through how to approach this, how to look at something, and giving honest feedback. Even if it's a work I had never played myself, but um, you can start to do kind of create deductive reasoning within it all. Yeah. Uh, what artists have been most influential to you in your life so far? And what ways have they affected your approach to music? Do you have any advice for playing a cellist for vibrato, color palette? Oh, so many great things here. Okay. Okay, so okay, I'll try to put both of these things together. Um, so I guess artists that have been most influential. Um, wow, that's a... Um, I would say Ursula Oppens, one, as a keyboardist, uh, her sense of color attack. Um, a lot of my colleagues when I was studying in Basel, the Schola Cantorum, which is 
looking a lot at Baroque music and kind of understanding phrase structure, continuo, continual writing, um, the role of the continual uh, musician in, in connection with the rest of the ensemble, uh, especially if you're dealing with soloists. Um, also, um, Andrei Milinov is um, probably one of my most um, influential teachers, even after the years of studying with him. Someone that always pushed the idea of there's, there's still more, there's, you can still do more, and to stay as open. Even when I started commissioning works, I remember he would tell me, um, oh, do you think there's not enough cello repertoire out in the world that you need to go and create your own? And I was like, yeah, because it's for me, not, <laughs> and not necessarily uh, for the rest of the world, but I do hope at some point that other cellists do take on this work. But he's one that always kind of challenged me to kind of think out of the box and really question what it is I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And that's kind of a constant, I think that's a lifelong thing um, that we as people, but also we as artists are looking at the idea of how do we continually evolve um, our view of what it is we're doing as artists and as musicians and why we still continue to do it. Why do we have, we create that longevity over long periods of time and beyond just performing, but also giving back that's part of it also uh, we're not just always we're not always going to be performers forever and ever and ever at heart yes but eventually um, a new new generations come through and we have to then kind of help usher them in and keep them going and give them the, the life advice that we've learned along the way um, and what would you be up to oh uh, well approach I could uh, approach to music so a lot of it kind of came in you know I think you studied for a long time I feel like I'm still studying just by myself um, but I think in working with certain people I started to pick up certain ideas that necessarily didn't really necessarily have to do with technique tech, technique in that sense but more musicality and kind of um, what is being written when in what time periods and how that's being affected um, by social movements by what's happening in the world by what's happening in their communities and how do I find that that, um, that connection in, in the work um, and therefore how do I, I relate to it and how can I tell my story while telling their story at the same time and Ursula was really good at kind of pinpointing that and showing me composers um, uh, that I could find these connections to whether it was Brahms or it was Rachmaninoff or it was George Walker or if it was uh, Shostakovich uh, or Martinu, um, and then trying to find ways for me to kind of hear my voice in all of it and understand why they're why they're writing these things and what it what what its intention is. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, advice on expanding a cellist vibrato color palette. Uh, finger speed in conjunction with bow. So another thing I really love. Um, is these kind of come to work position here or first position. It doesn't really matter. Anywhere along here, I put the thumb behind the first finger because I think it gives me a little bit more freedom um, in the hand, but however you'd like, but as long as the hand stays free um, and you're not having to force too much. So what I do is I drop all the weight in the left shoulder and also just I kind of imagine I'm putting it into my elbow um, and with the bow, it's a, been an interesting day before and then I come to the cello the next day and I'm a little sore or not feeling as you know comfortable uh, with the instrument it's a way to kind of get things moving again and freedom again I start to play with the um, with the speed and also directionality of course I think eventually we learn about we learn what kind of vibrato is going to work best for us but also with freedom in the hand um, and I slow it I slow the, 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 the vibrato down
elements in different positions also as well because the coloring changes based on kind of where you are. But you want it to still feel consistent regardless if it's a... Uh, but you probably hear, hopefully you can hear, as I move the elbow up, the directionality or how the sound spins changes. But I try to keep it, so I think that's one way of starting and also playing around with uh, bow positioning. Also if you're at the tip or if you're at the heel or in the middle. Um, and that's on not necessarily on long, um, like sustained bows, but on ryth rhythmic bows as well. Um, and figuring out exactly um, what works, what sounds good for you, what also allows you to kind of move from note to note, uh, especially in long sus uh, suspended phrase, uh, phrase structures. So those is uh, kind of like a one thing I, I could definitely tell you, and it's, it's uh, harder than it looks. <laughs> uh, definitely, you should definitely try it. Um, important physical uh, elements to be aware of when molding the tone of a note's decay. Um, okay, okay, um, contact to the fingers, uh, and also elbow, 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 it may, it may, like, especially if you're dealing with a... So at the end of a note, if you're trying to, if, if, even if it's a decrescendo that you have, especially even over a long period of time, whether that's kind of... If that's on an up bow or a down bow, a lot of people don't like doing up bow. <laughs> but it's a tool you should definitely learn to do. Don't don't um don't skimp on the on the um you should definitely um uh, figure out if it's actually in the fingers that decay needs to happen in the fingers or if it's happening in the wrist or if it's in the elbow or it's, it's a combination of the two. So is it the elbow that starts that and slows the bow down and then it's the fingers that take over to keep the balance of sound and also kind of the the Continuation of sound. Sorry, guys. I think the speaker is going in and out. Um, and um, from Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor. Uh, what music will you be playing in the coming months? Which, uh, while we still aren't traveling much, uh, Bach. <laughs> I will be playing a lot of Bach. Um, I have two new cello concertos that were supposed to be um, premiered in um, April and June, so they are being moved to the next season, so that kind of tacks on more to the next season, or whatever that's gonna look like. So I'm just now, at this moment in time, kind of coming back to this new concerto by Taishan Suri, uh, brilliant, brilliant composer, um, and working through that, that work, which is extremely slow and quite, um, as far as it, the cellist needs to create a lot of resonance in the sound, so how, do I create power in grounding down through the body and then there's really always feeling as if everything needs to be held up. How can I create that kind of um, experience for myself but also for audiences and in concert halls um, with kind of with the most possible ease because it's a rather slow work as well. So it's it's a lot of work for the child. So it's a different type of kind of virtuosic stamina that one has to build up. So I'm now kind of getting back into that work but also continuing on with Bach um, as I'm going to start to be recording kind of our first few movements um, for my next album in conjunction with two other unique uh, contemporary work so gearing up for that so that's what I'm doing outside of that it's a lot of just technical studies um, yeah uh, let's see uh, do you have any tips for warming up efficiently Okay, uh, for warming up efficiently, um, you need to warm up your body first, uh, not necessarily just with the instrument. So I'm always an advocate of stretching, stretching fully and, um, and in a healthy way. Um, by yourself or first, make sure you're, sure you're also, you're also definitely in stretching and moving these out, even if you need to do some type of essential oils to kind of get things moving. Um, and then I come to the cello and I'm always, I'm working for the first and foremost, just on the bow arm, because I always think of that as like the tongue. Um, so I'm really working on the bow arm in different parts and making sure I'm kind of like moving kind of like the dust away uh, and getting that to flow as easy as possible. And then I start to bring things in together. 
but I'm always doing, I always start with uh, thirds, fourths, and sixths uh, as kind of the thing, just to kind of get the hand to start stretch, get it to uh, move into wider positions to stretch them out and bring them back. Um, then I do a lot of chromatic based uh, work. Um, what else I do? Regular scales. Um, I'm also looking at finger replacements. Um, so I create kind of different patterns, not always like one to two, two to three, three to four, and then four back to one, but one to four or four to two. So any, any of those combinations, and then I'll create, just I'll make up my own kind of uh, passage work and then I'll start doing those same types of things and, and creating those things especially because the fourth is always a little bit weaker mm -hmm. so these are things that I look at how can I get the hand ready to kind of take on whatever it is I'm going to take on today but also just to keep you as fit as possible um, looking at vibrato also on, on its own um, as another tool I think we always think that vibrato is like a, a constant and it always has to be activated but vibrato is actually a coloring mechanism so it not the faucet's not always on it's it's only in moments where you really feel it needs to be or to kind of help as a kind of a binder from one section to the other especially if you're dealing with shifts sometimes it actually does help a slight bit of vibrato added or you increase the velocity slightly so really starting to work on the vibrato to kind of get get it all moving together um, but especially the chords that's like the first thing I do uh, when I'm coming when I actually start to add the hand and very calm relaxed not like oh it's getting it down but just like feeling what that looks like working through it chromatically and then I start doing uh, scales based on it either that's in uh, majors or minors or, or diminished yeah so those are because you will then realize when you actually come to other chords you're like oh I'm ready I'm ready uh, yeah uh, teaching is an integral part of a musician's career. How do you begin and develop your pedagogical skills and how uh, have they evolved over time? I was really lucky to serve as a teaching assistant to one of my teachers for quite a few years. So I really watched them, but I also sat in on a lot of uh, lessons for other um, other instruments, other uh, also vocal also. Sometimes I was playing um, continuo in my undergrad and also in grad school. Um, so watching and seeing how they talked about it, how they talked about voice leading lines and melody. Um, so that for me, that was really exciting um, to see kind of how how this teacher approaches and how they work with each student who's so different. As you know, everyone has a different set of um, faculties all kind of in place and how you address those things. Um, but also, talking with my other colleagues who are like music ed educators, not necessarily only those that are kind of teaching privately, but also teaching large scale groups of, uh, of students with a wide varying uh, skill levels and aptitude levels, um, and how you create um, kind of curriculum and patience and time for each of those students. Um, yeah, and then from that, I think you really start to kind of pull together ideas. And I've, I'm always looking to see also what else is out there, what's been written, not necessarily as a technical books, but also just kind of uh, theoretical, methodological books as well on cello technique, but also on pedagogy and looking at that and finding something that really works for you, but that's kind of tried out that can work on other students that you'll see. And I talk to my other colleagues as well, you know, I'm looking at this idea. I've definitely seen in this modern day and age of social media, I've seen some colleagues, you know, pose a question on like Instagram or on Facebook or something, or even on Twitter um, about, you know, one of the students is having this issue. And I think we should, as a community, like, there's no, we don't want it to feel like there's just the magic that, you know, we just, we just do this thing on the instrument. But, you know, like working as a community, how do we continue to talk about process and practice, practice-based research in that way, pedagogically, and share that um, across, across fields? Because some of us have, so many of us have come from a same lineage of a few specific teachers, or don't at all. Um, but it's all kind of rooted around something, um, specific types of schools and ways of approaching, but we can kind of learn. And there are certain things that some of us didn't learn in school um, that we learned kind of on the job, you know, working with our other colleagues. So those are some of the ideas, I think, just having open conversation and then also looking at what you've learned already, what worked
works for you um, and continue um, deep diving into how you're making those sounds, how you're creating that facility around your instrument as you then relate it to your students or even just for yourself as you're continuing to grow yourself even if you're 65, 70 years old. There's still there's still work to do, you know, there's still work to do. Uh, even if that's just, you know, um, just long tones, you know, and then just being able to have even more facility um, at the heel um, with, with the left hand, it's always heavier there. So how can you just use the fingers only or the fingers and the wrist to create more facility there and also great tone production, whether that's um, a piano, that's a forte, fortissimo, um, or kind of moving between the two and then different types of colors. So that's it's not easy, but I think we're all still kind of growing. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. How was your perspective as a musician and artist changed throughout your career? Anything, any tips for having good goal control or successfully contacting and replaying the piano? Okay, so two different questions. Okay, um, perspective. I think maybe we've answered some of this before. Um, it's constantly evolving. I think as, as far as a musician and as an artist, um, now more so I'm finding that it's less about me and more about the next generation. Um, I continue, of course, to have my voice in there because I think it's, it's very much so uh, still important. I'm not, I'm not done yet. <laughs> in some ways, only getting started. But I think when I started out, you know, there was this specific kind of idea that was being peddled around the conservatory. This is the kind of career you're going to have. This is the life you should be aiming for. Uh, when in reality, you know, everyone has a different um, different career path and different types of access as they kind of come through. Um, but I think you should dream as big as you possibly can and then continue to reevaluate, you know, a five-year or a ten-year goal um, or, you know, pivotal points and then also, you know, where you're going. I've had some colleagues who spent, you know, so many years playing modern cello and then something clicked and they took a continual class or they took a, a class on Baroque music or Renaissance music and it changed their lives and or they went to hear some concerts of Baroque music um, or, or Renaissance music and have literally switched careers. I mean they still you know do play modern instruments a little bit but the, the trajectory changed and it wasn't that you know Baroque music was being something that they were telling you know, one was studying directly. Now more so I think in conservatories you have a um, even more access to have that as be kind of a a direct career drive for you, which I think is absolutely amazing. And, and the community is so wide and the field is so wide, and sometimes it can feel as if it's um, rather small. So I think it's important um, to kind of continue to reevaluate what kind of music it is that you love to do, uh, what type of collaborations. We're not always going to only play by ourselves, and a lot of I love working with other people and collaborating. Sometimes I don't get to do it so much just because of my career, and so much of it is solo. Um, but collaboration, I think, is always exciting. I think continuing to have those collaborations beyond what you think um, is the you know, is the kind of the trajectory for collaboration. It's not only chamber music. That's with dance companies. That's with visual artists. That's with installation artists. Um, I mean, it's it's a, it's wide and varied with opera companies. I mean, it, I think think as far as you possibly could go. It could be with animators and still playing Bach, still playing Shostakovich, still playing Brahms, or playing Helmut Lachmann, or Benjamin Britten. I mean, it's it's wide ranging. I think so. I still say you know play all of it. Play the lavago. You know play play all of it, um, and I think that will start to kind of give you more and more insight as you continue to go on um, on what it is you really love to do, and that's going to be multifaceted. It's not going to just be one thing. I, I promise you. Um, good bow control uh, and good contact. Um, where is the weight? Where is the weight? Where is the weight? Even if it's out here, you know, if it's out here at the tip or if it's here at the heel, um, or it's right in the, right down the middle, what, what are you activating? Um, so I think that's the thing for you to start to look at yourself um, and figuring out, does the, elbow need, does the elbow need to be higher or lower? Where is the weight? Am I grounding into my hips or am I holding? Am I holding? I find a lot of times, a lot of cellists, a lot of musicians in general that are holding in their hips. So. A great friend, actually, Seon uh, Goshen Bapia, the Icelandic cellist who teaches at the University of Washington. Good friend, she's awesome. Uh, she plays on a yoga ball. She plays on a yoga ball specifically because of posture, but also because of releasing the hips and also just placement of feet. You want to feel grounded. You want to feel grounded but loose and, and free. 
So sometimes, even with my students, even if I'm doing it, I just play just maybe sometimes just two notes or one note. And I want to feel like figure out exactly what it is. Where am I holding? Am I? I need to do a body scan of where am I holding tension first of all because that's like the flower. If you give it too much water or something, or something is dying, it's still going to try to feed energy to that. So you have to snip it off, but you're not you're not cutting anything out yourself. You're just trying to redirect it all and figure out where it is you're holding. How can you release that and move that energy somewhere else? So if you're holding there, try to figure out how can I put it actually into the hands. Is it? I always want to feel as if I have a good direct contact. I'm using some part of the of the first finger, but also the fourth finger for balance, and I'm either pulling or pushing. Sometimes I'll play with I'll play with a double chord. Um, intonation uh, I practice with digital tuner okay trying to keep it in the green okay that's gonna be a long practice session uh, Kevin uh, <laughs> uh, looking at that so I think also one good part is understanding um, harmonic theory so understanding what kind of chords you're making so is it the fur is it the root of that chord whatever the chord is you're looking at or if it just a singular single bass pitching, not having doubles of anything. Um, understanding the finger spacing and structure and then how the pitch you're coming from before, how that relates to the next pitch. So think, think of it almost like in broken chords. So if you have a G, so G to E flat or I would really play around with those things. 
and it's not necessarily only just the independent pitch. Always using open strings if you have that option, even if it's not the relative same pitch. Also um, creating kind of um, um, interesting chords against them. So. between the two lights and darks. Um, so if you're starting out, you definitely want to feel, I always feel like I'm, it's like a, a gust of air, it's like a like creating a, a, a woo or a W sound in some ways. Not always applicable, but if you're just trying to kind of start out dealing with kind of a core sound, is the sound turning? Do you hear a ring that's in there? If, it's, if you're pressing down too much, you're kind of, you're, you're joking it. So don't do that. Never choke this down. Never feel like as if you're going downwards unless it's like a composer is asking for this very angular bow. In that way, that's a very different type of technique. But just for regular things, I'm always feeling the elbow is always the first start. If I look at it, the elbow starts and then the wrist oscillates and then I just, I kind of maintain here. And then the fingers take over to sustain it across. So this is really slow, meditative work. When I was younger, I hated doing this. But I've come to like, it's like one of my favorite things to do because if you have a great sound, I, it's like, it's golden, that's like currency. And then of course technique, but also expression and being able to, how can you um, change between those things uh, fluidly? But use, just really try to look at the elbow as a kind of a great starting point there and then figuring out kind of what is the hierarchy of movement that's actually happening and which parts, which ligaments of the body are working together, both on the up bow and the down bow. That same idea where I talked about, even if you, you're out here at the, at the tip, sometimes that's really hard, um, especially when you're starting out younger, or even some, as you're older in some other music that's, <laughs> that's challenging, uh, to keep, keep things quite um, sustained at the tip of it, at the tip of the bow. So really looking at how you can kind of control this and have the same type of sound at the tip that you'd have in the middle, and also at the heel, um, and try to play some of those passages and figure out, you know, what, um, how much bow do you actually need to create that sound and create it in a, in a way that's uh, that's very free? Because the sound should always feel free in that way. It shouldn't feel like it's anxious unless you know the music can sound anxious, but 
anxious, but you're sound, should, you should want to work towards having it feel just so fluid and you can just do, feel like you could do anything. Uh, yeah, okay, am I out of here? Okay, um, any advice to relax the most before and after daily practice? Warm up and warm down. This is like my best, like my best thing I can tell anyone. Uh, I came to yoga at 14 because um, I had a rotator cuff injury uh, over playing, and <laughs> which caused me to really deep dive into why I play and like what what am I doing physically. Um, and I came to yoga and I came to Belgian Christ and really looking at the body. And I, I'm okay now. I'm, I'm, I'm doing really well. Um, that was like 14 years ago. Re rehabilitation, but then caused a whole many many years over a decade looking at the body and finding kind of holistic ways to, um, to play so that, you know, I can be 80, 90 and still playing to some capacity. Um, so I, I really think that um, stretching before and after the body itself, but also I think coming back to, even if you've had like long practice sessions of um, slightly easier or even more difficult music, I would definitely say to come do a warm down, even if that's a slow scale, just long bows just to kind of you know, like you warm up and then you warm down don't forget to warm up that warm down um it's i promise you it's it, um it's going to save you and keep you going much longer um also if you are having shoulder or back pain you need to figure out exactly i think positioning like where where do you feel like where is the access of balance are you holding um tension in your feet or toes sometimes i tell people to leave the heel down and raise the front feet raise them up and then that kind of starts to activate something different and, and kind of redirect movement but also feel like you're kind of dropping the weight into the hips and you can kind of move with it so sometimes I have people play Bach or play Schubert and to kind of <laughs> they're dancing but you start to see kind of how the sound changes how the direction changes, but also um, freedom in playing and playing because they're, they're holding in the bottom for interesting reasons or they're holding it in their mouth so like opening the mouth, putting the tongue out, and playing. I know it sounds silly, but it really does help you start to realize that what, what you're doing, you know, and why you're doing it. You probably don't need to do that. Um, and is it, where does, where do those, those moments of tension actually occur in specific types of compositional writing? And then how you can kind of work to kind of reverse that, yeah. Um, pretty much out of time here. Uh, sometimes there's no progress in practicing a piece. How long should I go on? How do you decide when to stop practicing a piece, especially if it's an etude? Um, do not over practice. Don't over practice. Uh, practice smart. Um, I think at times really look specific, look like really kind of parse things, break things down. Look at exactly the, the section that you know you really need to look at. Um, obviously everything you need to be able to understand exactly what is you're doing, why you're doing it, and the kind of directionality and you feel that it's embodied within the work. But I, I think we all kind of went through a period in time where, you know, we have to be doing six hours a day, eight hours a day. You can be practicing eight hours a day and have accomplished nothing or near to a very, very little. So I think like uh, smart practicing, really looking and zooming in on specific sections. If it's a technical thing, really break down um, what part of the of the technical of the, the difficulty is there for you? So it, maybe it's the first two notes, or the last two notes. It's part of the run, the second half of the run, or it's a connected transition in in the work. So if it's like a so maybe it's just one or two notes that that's in there. So or it's just a it's a it's kind of uh, kind of creating balance between going from one string to the other. So I'm not gonna practice the whole scale because it makes no sense. So maybe it's the first three notes or the first two. So I know if I need to come to that, what happens before? What do I need to do with the body or, or the hand or the arm or the elbow to help prepare me for those things? Obviously this is more ch slightly easier than some of the other stuff. Uh, that one can be playing that, that calls for different types of uh, technical difficulty. So I think really trying to isolate those things. Um, and sometimes you don't have a lot of time. I would sometimes would run back to my, in college, I would run back to my dorm room and I'd have like 45 minutes, right? 30 minutes. So I had like 10 minutes to work on like two beats of a measure, then like run back, run to the next class or something, or find a little practice room quickly in between classes or rehearsals. Um, so you start to learn to practice um, more smart. And then when you feel like there's no practice, uh, progress, I, I think, take breaks. It's, it's important to take the breaks, breathe, come away, 
get some water, bathroom break, whatever it is, go take a walk for a few minutes and then come back and you know, shake it all off and start over again. And maybe not, don't just look at the same thing over, maybe come to something else that's maybe earlier or later um, in, in that passage work and then come back to it. Uh, yeah. Um, can you talk about the challenges and benefits of playing the works of other composers? Do you ever feel micromanaged or always take the composer's word as truth? Okay, so this is um, this is a, a life long <laughs> kind of journey and lesson here. Um, so I think there are schools of thought where the composer is kind of hierarchically um, kind of the truth all the time, and I have learned to kind of challenge um, some of these things. I think it depends on what that relationship is and how you build that relationship from honesty and not necessarily you know, you're at the mercy of the composer, but you're both collaborating. One has written the text and written the story, you still have to tell the story. So the more you can ask of them and in a way that puts you both on equal footing, um, I think the better, the better off everyone really is. Because it's a collaboration, it's not one is more empowered than the other. You both have agency and you want to try to work together to get the best possible results. That then also leads to future collaboration and future friendships. I've had so many uh, moments in my life where um, I've worked with so many different type of composers and different types of collaborative processes and learning processes, especially notational issues that I may not have known at the time, but I have to sometimes learn rather quickly or um, kind of go back to the drawing board after I, you know, wait, it's not working or, or also feel free to offer solutions to things, but make sure you're also exhausting all possible um, options for yourself and not say, well, that's not possible. Really, can you actually kind of go back to your own drawing board and figure out, is there, is there possibly another way to do this thing? If we're thinking about quick senate techniques, but if we're thinking about more straight ahead punch, is there another, are there, are there multiple ways? In the same way that you look at Bach and you look at Brahms and you look at Schubert and Beethoven, are there different ways to approach this work? Are there different ways to approach this melody or um, this idea? How does your part add to it? Where, and what are you doing um, subjectively to kind of help heighten the work as well? Are you, are you giving your all to it? And then bringing that to the composer and you know, making sure that they're also, you know, they're also giving a lot. So it's a partnership in that way. Even if you're within an ensemble, you have to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same footing there because that's, I think that's going to give you the best possible, um, the most fruitful um, collaboration. Yeah. And then there is sometimes some micromanaging, but I think you know definitely don't forget you have agency. You have agency, and there's a way to make sure you do stand up for yourself, um, and make sure you take people to task if you know if, if they're um, you feel that that's being abused, that that's that's not right. Um, where are we next? Okay. I think that marks the end of the call. Oh, yep, okay, that's it. <laughs> um, okay, thanks everyone. This has been super awesome. Lots of really amazing questions. And um, everyone have a great weekend and stay safe. Wear your mask, wash your hands, um, and keep playing music. Keep, 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 keep going. Uh, it's an ever learning process for all of us and we're learning from, all, from each other. So um, thanks again. <laughs>